Holy God, give us today tender and responsive hearts so that we will humble ourselves before you when we hear your word, I pray. Amen. Well, we come now to really the key text in all of Mark's gospel. It's taken us almost 10 full chapters to arrive here, but we've finally really made it to the summit of Mark's gospel, where we can look back on where we've traversed so far, and it all begins to make perfect sense. But we can also look ahead to what is to come, and we can really see clearly what's going to lie before us in Mark's gospel. As we plan ourselves in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 45, Jesus' ministry and his mission they're brought into sharp focus for us. Today, we're going to have the third time in Mark's gospel that we're going to read Jesus prophesy that he's going to be killed. Three times he's told his disciples about his impending death, and now when we come to it in Mark 10, 45, Jesus explains why he would die, why he would lay down his life. This is the summary of his entire mission on earth, verse 45, to give his life as a ransom for many. The key to understanding all of Mark's gospel, as well as all of Jesus' earthly ministry and mission, lies enclosed in this single verse, in verse 45 of our text this morning. Jesus says, I have come not to be served, but to serve. That half of the verse really describes what he's been doing so far in his ministry in Mark's gospel. And then Jesus adds that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. That second half of the verse, that reveals to us what Mark is going to fixate on in the remaining pages and chapters of his gospel narrative. Chapters 1 to 10 focused on Jesus' servant ministry. Chapters 11 to 16 will focus on his saving mission. Because verse 45 is really so crucial to the entirety of Mark's gospel, we're going to spend most of our time unpacking that verse. It's a verse that really outlines the mission of Jesus Christ well, his example of selfless service for the saints to imitate, and it also exhorts sinners to be saved through his sacrifice. This is basically what I want us to embrace from Mark's gospel today, especially in light of verse 45. Jesus came to serve and suffer for sinners to save sinners by giving his life as a ransom. But before we get to verse 45, we do need to touch on Jesus' third passion prophecy that he makes here, as well as his discussion with James and John later on and his instruction to the rest of the disciples. So first, let's look at the prediction of the Son of Man, then the ambition of the sons of thunder, and then finally we'll come to verse 45 with the mission of the Son of Man. In verses 32 to 34, we have this third prediction of the Son of Man about his sufferings, his death, and his resurrection to come. I'm not going to belabor this point too long because we've really spent a lot of time already on the previous two predictions that came in 831 and 931, respectively. All I wish to do this morning is to just shine a light on some of the details of this third prediction and quickly show you how they're fulfilled later on in the rest of Mark's gospel. Verse 32, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, Jesus began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. This third prediction comes as Jesus and his disciples, they're making their ascent to the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city itself, lies on a hill. If you wanted to enter it, you had to ascend from whatever direction you were coming. We're going to see next week that they're going to make a short pit stop in the city of Jericho, but in a matter of a few days or so, Jesus is going to finally make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and by the end of that week, he will be crucified. 
No doubt his mind is flooded with many thoughts about his horrific death to come, which is fast approaching on his horizon. In this prediction, Jesus reveals more about the where, the how, the who, and the what of his sufferings, his death, and even his coming resurrection. Where would he suffer and die? He tells his disciples they're going up to the city of Jerusalem. How was this all going to come about, his sufferings and his death? Well, he would be delivered over or betrayed, as the word could read. Betrayed over to whom? The chief priests, the scribes of the Jews in that day. And then the Jews would hand him over to the Gentiles. And what would the Gentiles do with Jesus? Mock him, spit on him, flog him, kill him. And then what would happen after Jesus was killed? On the third day, he would rise. Mark is going to go on in his gospel to record the fulfillment of each of these details in Jesus' third passion prediction. I don't have the time to read each of these references. I trust that you can write them down fast enough as they're on the screen and look them up later, but you'll see what I mean when each of these details are fulfilled later on in Mark's gospel. In Mark 14.44, we see that, Jesus, that Judas really will betray Jesus. In 1453, Jesus is then going to be delivered into the hands of the high priest, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes of the Jews. In 15 verse 1, Jesus is then delivered to the Gentiles, specifically over to Pilate. In chapter 15 verses 17 to 20, and then on the cross in 29 to 30, we see that Jesus is mocked. Before that, he's spat on and he's flogged. In 1537, we see that Jesus breathes his last. He dies on the cross. And then, in the last chapter of Mark, in verse 6, Jesus is proclaimed by that angel at the tomb to be alive from the dead. And so we can see, really, the precision of Jesus' passion prediction here. Truly, Jesus really is a great prophet. But what his disciples had yet to discover was that he was more than a great prophet, even more than a great king that they were expecting. Jesus is the great savior for great sinners. And the way that he's going to save sinners is going to further be unveiled for us and for them in verse 45. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We witness next, really, the ambition of the sons of thunder, James and John. Back in Mark chapter 3, when Jesus uh, calls his disciples into his ranks to be apostles, Jesus has dubbed these two brothers as the sons of thunder. We can only speculate here, but presumably that name was for their fervency, their boldness, as well as their brazenness, as we see in their ambitious and audacious request of our Lord Jesus here in these verses. After Jesus predicts his sufferings, his death, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Matthew's gospel reads, In the kingdom of heaven. In the history of prayer requests, I'm not sure that you could list a more ill-timed, insensitive, ego-centered one than the one that James and John give to their Lord at this moment. I mean, think about it. Jesus, he's just finished this stunning prediction, an exposition of his sufferings and death. And along come James and John, his inner circle of three here, desiring power and prestige in the kingdom to come. While the Son of Man is contemplating his cross... The sons of thunder are concerned about their crowns. While Jesus is discussing his future sufferings, James and John evidently were deliberating over their future status. Really, James and John, they're shining examples of how we are not to pray. Next week, we'll see an example of how we are to pray. How would you have answered the request of these two brothers here in this moment? If we were Jesus, we'd probably have called down lightning from heaven upon their heads. Or maybe we would have fired them at that moment from the apostolic team, sent them home packing. You two are the weakest link. You guys can go home. I'm done with you. 
But Jesus isn't like us, thankfully. Jesus shows himself really to be really patient and perfectly long-suffering toward his ambitious, arrogant disciples. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it's been prepared. James and John, they've really all but demanded Jesus, make us significant somebodies. And Jesus has all but declared here to them, it's not my place to do that. However, you will share in my sufferings. That's the general gist of drinking Jesus' cup and being baptized with the baptism with which he would be baptized. It's not language of glory that Jesus is using. It's language of suffering. Of course, we know that's exactly what James and John will have to endure as Jesus' apostles. James would be martyred in Acts chapter 12, and John, according to church tradition, he would be boiled in steaming hot oil, only to survive and then be exiled to hard labor to work on the Isle of Patmos. This is Discipleship 101. Discipleship will mean enduring uh, sufferings and enduring and experiencing extreme calamity for the sake of Jesus Christ, for the sake of his gospel, for the sake of his glory. To identify with Jesus means sharing in his sufferings and sorrows before you will ever receive crowns and thrones from him. Well, understandably, the ambition of James and John doesn't go over well with the other ten. It results in them, in verse 41, showing them extreme indignation and anger. And Jesus is going to use their reaction, the ten's reaction to the two, as an opportunity to teach all of them, once again, on greatness and selflessness in his kingdom. And when the ten heard it, that is, James and John's request, they began to be indignant at James and John, and Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. While the other ten disciples are livid with James and John, most likely not because they've made this audacious request to Jesus at a bad time, but probably because James and John beat them to the punch. They wanted to ask this themselves. They've already argued who's the greatest. James and John get there first. They're not happy about that. But while they're doing that, Jesus is putting forth really the Gentile rulers to them as a negative example of greatness. Greatness in God's kingdom is not about power and prestige, Jesus is teaching. Greatness in his kingdom doesn't involve domination and tyrannical rule over the weak as the Romans were exercising over the Jews. Rather, greatness, says Jesus, means being a servant, even a slave. Jesus, he's been teaching all along to his disciples, really since he's first predicted his death back in chapter 8, That if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Chapter 9, when the disciples are bickering over who's the greatest, Jesus would go on to tell them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And now in verses 43 and 44, Jesus adds another dynamic to greatness in his kingdom. Not only must his disciples be those who are servants of all, but even lower than servants, slaves of all. You couldn't get any lower on the social totem pole. Servants and slaves. That really summarizes the Christian life well. Servants, they're those who are willingly rendering service to others. They're waiting tables, literally. That's what the word means. Slaves, on the other hand, communicates those who are consumed with the will of their master. One who has surrendered wholly to their master's will and is completely devoted to another to the disregard of their own interests. Jesus, he takes the world's understanding of greatness, he flips it upside down for all of his disciples, both then and now. 
Greatness is not being served by others, it's serving others. Being first is not about exercising your will and authority over others. It's about submitting to the will and authority of another, chiefly and firstly God, but also those people whom you are serving. If you want to be great, serve. If you want to be first, be a slave. To make sure that we can't miss his point, Jesus is going to put himself forward as the supreme positive example now of a servant to all mankind and a slave to his Father's will. Here we arrive at verse 45 and really to the mission of the Son of Man. In a single verse, Jesus sets himself up as the example to imitate, the example above all examples, while at the same time he explains why he came and what he has come to do. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. For the first time in all of Mark's gospel, Mark finally reveals the reasoning behind Jesus' sufferings and death. Mark has recorded Jesus making three predictions about his death so far, but until now, the why behind Jesus' death and sufferings have been veiled to Mark's readers. But now he's laying it bare for all to read. What Jesus ultimately came to do above everything else was to suffer to the point of death in order to ransom many. With the time remaining that we have, I want to highlight for you the two major reasons Jesus says he came in verse 45 here, which really summarize his entire earthly ministry and mission. Reason number one he came is service. Service. Jesus told his disciples, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Part of Jesus' ministry, part of his mission on earth was to put himself forward as the example to be followed and imitated by his disciples. This isn't the chief reason he came, mind you, but it is a big reason why he came. For some time now, Jesus, he's been telling his disciples, deny yourselves, be last of all, be servant of all, even be a slave to all. And how are they to understand what that looked like? What was Jesus really requiring of his disciples? Jesus is requiring nothing less than what he himself has already done through his supreme condescension from heaven, coming to earth in his incarnation, and his people-centered ministry that was taking place in the region of Galilee, along with the surrounding Gentile regions that we've seen him visit. Jesus is the ultimate example of one who has denied himself, one who has lowered himself to be last of all, and who has humbly served everyone. Over and over, we've read of how Jesus has cured the sick, cast out demons, he's cleansed a leper, he's catered to the masses, and he's cared for the Gentiles. Here, he's illustrating to the disciples what true, humble service is so that they would follow in his footsteps. Being a servant of all means doing all that Christ did. This is the big reason, a big reason, why he came. Jesus came to serve so that his followers would be able to serve just like him. Jesus, in effect, is saying, don't imitate the kings of this world if you want to be great. Imitate me, the king, in humble service if you want to be great. Well, obviously, an example of service isn't the be-all, end-all of Jesus' mission on earth. Ultimately, Jesus' earthly mission is going to culminate, it's going to climax, really, with his sacrifice. That's reason number two I want to highlight here in this verse. For even the Son of Man came to give his life. It's here that we finally learn that Jesus' upcoming sufferings and death, they're not without meaning, they're not without divine purpose. In the most supreme way possible, Jesus would offer himself up on, on the cross as a sacrificial lamb. A better sacrifice than those of the Old Testament, for his sacrifice would be once and for all far more effective than those sacrifices of the blood of bulls, goats, and lambs in the Levitical system. According to Jesus, in the last half of verse 45, his sacrifice really has three 
purposes that we can distinguish. Firstly, Jesus' sacrifice makes satisfaction. That's the idea behind this word ransom. This is why he gives his life. He sacrifices his life as a ransom. This word ransom is the first Greek word every Greek student learns in Bible college or seminary. I can tell you that by experience. It's the Greek verb luo. Luo is the go-to verb for students to learn how to conjugate and to parse the Greek language. If you can understand how to do that with this verb, you basically can unlock the rest of the Greek language. Well, here in verse 5, Mark uses it in the noun form, lutron. Lutron is a noun that would have been very familiar to all of Jesus' disciples as well as to Mark's Roman Christian readers. It was a word regularly used in the slave market and slave trade or in releasing prisoners of war. Rome was very effective in the slave trade and in having prisoners of war. And so a ransom price is, is required to liberate any slave from their master or to liberate a soldier from their bonds of the enemy army so that they can return home. The idea is that if you wanted to set a slave or a captive soldier free, you had to pay this set ransom price for their release. And usually this price was determined as the value of a human life. And that's the price that a slave or a captive soldier could never pay for themselves. The ransom had to always be paid by another. So behind this word ransom is that Jesus paid the satisfactory price required to satisfy the release of any enslaved captive sinner. But now the question becomes, to whom does Jesus pay this ransom? Back in the early centuries of the church, there was a man named Origen. He put forth a theory of the atonement called the ransom to Satan theory. The theory states that when Christ gave his life as a sacrifice, his death paid a price to Satan in order to secure the sinner's release from bondage to Satan's kingdom. For many reasons, this theory is downright unbiblical and wrong, and I'll tell you why. For one reason, nowhere in the Bible do we read that sinners owe anything to Satan. The debt that sinners owe because of sin is not to the devil. Sinners, they may be enslaved and held captive to him in his domain of darkness, but they're only in bondage to Satan because it's part of God's punishment for sin. For another reason, the Bible tells us that the debt sinners do owe because of their sin is ultimately to God, since he's the one whose holiness has been offended by the sinner. Payment of atonement to make things right for the sinner, it's owed to God alone. And yet another reason I say that this ransom to Satan theory is unbiblical is because the last time we saw Satan mentioned in Mark's gospel was back in chapter 8 where Jesus was plainly teaching that he must suffer and die. And lo and behold, Peter stands up and he rebukes the Lord. Satan is speaking through Peter, it seems here, and having plainly rebuked the Lord, the Lord turns and plainly rebukes Peter, get behind me, Satan. Throughout the four Gospels, we can see Satan deliberately tempting Jesus to skip the cross and seize the crown. Just bow the knee and all these kingdoms of the world will be yours. I'll give them to you. As if Jesus didn't create those kingdoms in the first place. Or later on, when he feeds the masses, the masses want to make him king there on the spot but instead he passes through their midst and goes away from them. Or in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus is sweating drops of blood, his agony is that he wants this cup to pass from him. And that's, I think, another last form of temptation from the devil. Take this cup from Jesus is what he's wanting Jesus to pray. And then Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done, Father. Ultimately, Satan does not succeed in getting Jesus to avoid the cross. God's plan advances without any hindrance. Jesus lays down his own life for his sheep, only to take it back up again. And so biblically, I think we should view the ransom that Jesus paid to set slaves and captives of sin free, according to the Bible, as paid in full to God the Father. 
There's no negotiation with Satan for the sinner's release. Jesus Christ ransoms the sinner as he crushes the head of the serpent at the cross. At the cross, the only thing that's paid to Satan is the death blow to his power, guaranteeing Satan that his kingdom is going to come to an end. The way we should understand Christ's atonement for sinners is that it was the full payment required to satisfy the justice and holiness of God. And that, friends, is a payment we could never make for ourselves or for another person. We owed a debt to God because of our sin, but because of our sin, we couldn't pay that debt ourselves. Neither could we pay the debt of another sinner. The psalmist explains this. Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. But praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter reminds us about the price that Jesus Christ paid in order to ransom us, to set us free. You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish, or spot. With man, this is impossible, but not so with God through his holy Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus has paid the price to his Father that was making satisfaction for sin and for sinners through his own bloody sacrifice. So, satisfaction, that's purpose number one. Secondly, substitution. It provides substitution. For even the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. At the root of this little word for in our English, and in the Greek especially, is the the theology of substitutionary atonement. I say this because the Greek word here is the word anti. Anti, it, it really means what our English word sounds like it means. It means against, or as opposed to, or more literally, instead of, in behalf of, or in place of. This little word anti tells us that it was the many who owed the ransom price, and yet it was not the many who paid the ransom price. It's the Son of Man who paid it on their behalf. As opposed to the many paying the ransom, the one Son of Man did concept of substitutionary atonement has been really present from Jesus' ministry since his baptism. When Jesus came to John to be baptized, John the Baptist sings out, Behold the Lamb of God, that substitution right there, who takes away the sin of the world. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, there was a spotless lamb that could be sacrificed in place of a sinner as a sin offering to the Lord to make atonement for their sins, restoring that sinner to a right relationship with the Lord. Instead of the sinner dying for their sin, a lamb would be killed in their place on the altar to satisfy the Lord's justice and holiness. That imagery of substitution is repeatedly used throughout the New Testament when speaking of Jesus' death. We saw the one passage already in 1 Peter 1 showing us how Jesus ransomed sinners by shedding his precious blood like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. Later, in chapter 2, Peter goes on to state that Jesus' sacrifice really was substitutionary. As he writes, Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. By his wounds you have been healed. And then later on in chapter 3, Peter will add, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. These verses echo the suffering servant presented in Isaiah 53 that we heard about a little earlier from our scripture reading. And there, the theology of substitution, it's practically in every verse. Verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and his wounds have healed us. Verse 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. Verse 11, he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12, he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. 
the hymn writer Philip Bliss, the author of the hymn that we sang earlier, I Will Sing of My Redeemer, inspired by this suffering servant in, in Isaiah 53. He wrote another hymn. It's typically sung on Good Friday and Good Friday services. He wrote a hymn on Jesus' substitutionary atonement called Hallelujah, What a Savior. Here are just two stanzas from this hymn. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon in his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior. This is the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The just for the unjust, the sovereign of the universe for weak sinners of the earth. The Son of God for the ungodly. Jesus Christ in place of God's enemies, bearing the wrath of God for sin in full measure to atone for their sins. Wages of sin is death, but Jesus Christ has paid those wages in full so that sinners are ransomed and can go free. That brings me to the third purpose of Jesus' sacrifice. It secures salvation for the many. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now we see in full why Jesus came, not just as a servant, but as a saving sacrifice. Not a sacrifice like those of the Old Testament that need to be offered again and again and again, but a sacrifice that sufficiently satisfies the holiness and justice of God against sin. It wonderfully substitutes the sinless Son of God for sinful, guilty men. A sacrifice that effectively liberates the slaves, the captives of sin and Satan, and transfers them into the marvelous kingdom of light once and for all, forever. The ransom is paid. The lamb has been provided in the place of many so that many could go free. Have you tasted this unending love, this amazing grace from our Lord? This is what every sinner in this room needs to know and put their trust in. Hear the anointed, suffering, servant, Savior proclaiming to you liberty and life. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed, Jesus tells you. He promises, I have given my life. I have paid the ransom in full. It is finished. Whoever looks to me and believes in me shall be saved and have everlasting life. So here's the takeaway for all of us this morning. If you've not yet believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, do so today and be saved. Be liberated from your bonds to sin and Satan. Believe and be free from the chains of sin, guilt, Satan, and judgment. Look with eyes and a heart full of faith to the substitutionary sacrifice of the suffering servant, Savior Jesus Christ, who satisfies the justice and holiness of God for you. Beloved brothers and sisters, those of us who have been ransomed by Jesus, we need to reckon this singular truth in our hearts this morning. We who have been ransomed have become the property and possession of the one who has freed us. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. To Titus, Paul wrote, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. We've been saved to serve. Saved to serve our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. Saved to serve one another in love and with good works. Having been ransomed by the suffering servant Savior, we belong wholly to him and he now calls us to follow in his footsteps of selfless service and sacrifice. May the gospel of Jesus Christ make something great out of us, for our debt has been paid. Now let's love him supremely and and live for him sacrificially. Amen.